Well, hello, ladies. Simone here, Director of Program Growth, and I am super happy to be here today with Jim Schuster. Jim, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. So, thank you. It's awesome to be here. So happy that you're here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a few weeks now, and um, I would like to, for you to introduce yourself, but um, before, before you do that, I'm just so glad that you picked this document, Dominus Jesus, and we'll kind of get into, into all of that. But Jim, tell us a little bit about what you do. I know that um, Endow hosted two Rhema workshops with you wow. and your lovely wife, Jonna Schuster, from Catholic Revival Ministries. T tell us more about that and, and what you're up to these days, Jim. Yeah, exactly. Well, Yes, it's wonderful to be here. As you said, John, uh, my wife, Jonna, and I, we run Catholic Revival Ministries, and we are really just, uh, our heart is to um, equip people to go further in their spiritual life, and, and especially um, to help people grow and develop in the area of spiritual gifts. That's a real emphasis for us, uh, because these are ways that the Holy Spirit empowers us to have an impact in the world, to, to build God's kingdom. And so, we're, we're really all about that. And, and um, you know, a little bit more background on me. I spent 10 years in full-time ministry um, prior to, you know, in parish ministry, prior to uh, starting up Catholic Revival Ministries in the last few years. Uh, I have a master's degree in systematic theology, and uh, that's where I was first introduced to this document, Dominus Jesus, because my, my, um, my real area of forte in, in theology is systematic theology, which is kind of like the nuts and bolts. I kind of compare like uh, systematic theology is to moral theology, kind of like physics is to chemistry. It sort of tells you how it all works uh, kind of underneath the, uh, the hood, so to speak. So that's what I really enjoy. And, and so this document is a very systematic theology heavy kind of document. And I fell in love with it right away the first time I read it. So. so Jim, why did you choose systematics for your emphasis in theology? I, you know, I, I kind of just gravitated towards it. That's kind of uh, the easiest way to say it. Um, I did my undergraduate in mathematics. And so I have a real um, value for logic, for all of the pieces fitting together, you know, very cohesively. And that is, that's really kind of the goal of systematic theology. It might be kind of even contrasted with a more spiritual theology, which, um, which is more about maybe like, the cultivation of the heart or the cultivation of the spirit and is a little less concerned about precisely connecting the dots because it's more about connecting with the Lord directly. And so, um, but yeah, it's I, like, I just love, I love logic. I love when, um, when you can connect all the dots. So I just, I just naturally gravitated towards it. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I also emphasize in systematics, but I think the way that my school is interpreting systematic was really church history heavy. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is well, kind yeah, of maybe with an emphasis on the, the fathers and the development of doctrine over time. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. That's pretty. That's pretty, really neat. Yeah. Pretty neat. But so, you know, as you know, Endow calls women together to study important mm -hmm. documents of the Catholic Church. And so the podcast this year is really like leaning, leaning into that very heavily. And yeah. so when we were talking about what to you know, discuss in the podcast, I was surprised in a very good way that you chose this document, Dominus Jesus, on the unicity and salvific universality of Jesus Christ and the church, because when I read it in graduate school, I, it was like very striking for me. I, I never forgot it. It was life changing. So Jim, why did you choose this document? <laughs> um, to be honest, it's partially because I just wanted to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, but once I once I kind of you know I was kind of looking back over some some various options and and I um I love like probably my favorite set of documents is is just all of the documents of Vatican II they're very formative for me um in my early growth stages in the faith um and uh, but uh, this one was a little bit later than that you know it's thirty five years after Vatican II um, and uh, and it's still kind of addressing, you might say, some of the um, some of the lingering turmoil that came out at that that period in history at, around the, the events of Vatican II. Um, and so, uh, in some ways, it's sort of like a, the next step for me. But um, but I also felt like it it was 
going to speak to a lot of what we encounter in our everyday life. It's really trying to say, um, how can we uh, put the, the right kind of framework on our approach to, to understanding the faith on a deeper level? And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that as we go, but that's sort of, um, yeah, what drew me to it. Yeah, uh, well, with the endow kind of curriculum offerings, we have one of the four major constitutions of the church as an endow study, Lumen Gentium, which is originally yeah. I think what you were thinking we would talk about. Yeah. Um, but as you mentioned, this document came out uh, through the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under the pontificate of John Paul II, and the prefect at the time was uh, Joseph Ratzinger, which who eventually became yep. Benedict the Sixteenth. So, why should and you know, good news, this document isn't very long. I think it's about 12 or 13 pages. So, you know, anybody can, of course, I'll link it to the show notes, but why should we care about this document? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I think I'll start by just talking about why was it written? And it, and it does actually link back to Vatican II and as we were talking about, um, because uh, one of the things that was a little bit new in Vatican II was um, the church really starting to explore um, what is our relationship with this modern world. So it's it's less about clarifying real specific doctrines and more about, it's a much more pastoral council. Um, that's not to say that there's not doctrinal teaching and content in there, but, um, but it's really talking about how do we relate to the world. And one of the ways that it was, one of the things that was trying to unfold and unpack was how does our Catholic faith relate to other religions? Um, and so it, it, Vatican II really encouraged exploration in this er, area, um, encouraged you know, expanding religious dialogue and, and things like that. Um, and there was, uh, you know, after that, there was um, wonderfully a, a flourishing of, of activity in this area, you know, thoughtful dialogue between uh, our Catholic faith and other religions. But in the midst of this, there were also some problematic um, viewpoints and theologies that started to emerge. Some, some interpretations that um, started to stray from traditional Christianity and, and you know, Catholic doctrine. And so Dominus Jesus, it, it, it sets itself up, this document, as um, addressing some of those ways that theology had, has gone off track. You know, some, some of the um, more problematic theories that have been proposed about our relationship. Um, and, and it wants to set some guardrails. It wants to say, you know, within this exploration, um, you know, it, it explicitly says, hey, we're not gonna, we're not gonna try to solve all of the theological issues, but we do wanna say, if you're, you know, here are kind of, here's kind of the, the, the boundaries within which that theological discussion and dialogue can occur. Um, almost like, you know, like bumper bowling, you know, if you go bowling, you put the bumpers in there. It's like, it keeps you in the right lane, right? How do you know when you've gone outside of that? Um, and so it wants to, it wants to foster continued, um, you know, interreligious dialogue while without compromising the integrity of the Catholic faith. Um, yep. and so, um, yeah, that's kind of a quick yep. summary of why it was written, but then to your question, why should we care about it? You know, what's the application for us? Um, if I'm not somebody, if not, if I'm not a theologian who is, you know, trying to work out this interreligious dialogue question, how might it apply to me, you know, the average everyday Catholic? Um, and one thing, and, and what, what I really felt like connected here was, I felt like everything that this document talks about could be equally applied in the, uh, wherever we see the phenomenon of deconstructionism going on. And I'm going to give a, a, a kind of my own definition of what I mean by that. Yeah, um, I was going to say, what, 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 yeah, when you say deconstructionism, what do you mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that deconstructionism is, um, is a reinterpretation of Christianity through the lens of an alternative philosophy. Um, and what kind of, uh, you know, so some examples of that might be like um, where, uh, that some of those lenses might be, let's say, psychology or like the Eastern religions, maybe like new age spirituality, new gender ideologies, even just like modern secular culture. But what I think makes deconstructionism kind of unique is that it's typically happening uh, 
where somebody isn't, you know, flatly like rejecting or abandoning their Christian background, but they're kind of reframing it in a certain ways. It's sort of like, um, it's sort of like if you had like a, a, a house that was made of Legos yeah. and then you, you know, deconstructed it, you took all the Legos apart and then you reassemble it. And now it's an airplane. You'd say, yeah, it looks like it has all the same pieces, but it's a different thing now. And, yeah. and so, um, very often I, I think that like, yeah, so that's kind of what yeah. I mean by that. I, I think that's a fantastic definition. So impressive. Well done. <laughs> um, I think what's kind of interesting, <laughs> this is very metaphysical or maybe just meta, I don't know what, but you know, whenever we a uh, fashion Jesus or the church, even as professed Christian, like Catholics, mm -hmm. um, to our own ideologies without realizing it, we are, <laughs> deconstructing it and i think that's kind of a temptation right yeah so yeah, I, exactly yeah i i think i was on a deconstructionist podcast i think i was interviewed on a deconstruction yeah. which was fascinating to me because the catholic faith is so contra deconstructionism mm -hmm. because like there is no framework but jesus christ and him crucified yeah, yeah. Uh, so i was kind of i thought that was kind of cool um just yeah. like, well, they're open to to talking to me and interested in talking to me. So, yeah. so with, with that in mind, um, was it like your, your interest in kind of maybe evangelizing deconstructionists or how are, how are we supposed to understand? Yeah. Deconstruction? I think that, that yeah. can be part of it. Uh, um, it, you know, I think some of it is just like, it, as I look out in the, in the world and I might see, you know, um, you know, there, it might actually happen with some very public figures who, yeah. who you say, gosh, there was, it's, they, there's something different about the way they're talking about Catholicism now or about Jesus. And there's something that feels off about it. And there, this might help to pinpoint some of those reasons why. Um, and, but I think there's another kind of application here. And that is that um, in, I think oftentimes um, it can be easy to look at, at somebody who's kind of going down that deconstructionism route and to kind of assume that they probably went there because they're kind of becoming spiritually sluggish. You know, they're like, you know, they kind of got a little lazy with their faith or, or they're just not really growing anymore. And they started to branch out and to look to different areas um, to kind of um, fill that void or something like that. But I think that I think that um, that's not always the right picture of what's actually going on. I think that oftentimes people who go down that road it's actually because they are growing spiritually. Yeah. They're growing spiritually and the same kind of like eighth grade confirmation class stock answers that they've, they, they keep getting aren't actually meeting. They're not lining up with their experience. They're not helping them to really understand their own experience. And so they might look outside of, outside of the Catholic church um, for a, a different kind of interpretation, a different sense of meaning. Um, and, uh, and of course, again, this document is saying, Hey, we're not trying to squelch, you know, this kind of dialogue with the world and with different viewpoints. Um, there's a lot that we can gain and benefit from that, um, in doing that. Um, but we need to go about that safely. And so we all, I think this, there's a kind of deconstructionism that always takes place with spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. that, that's, there's always this kind of re-examining this, this, um, taking things that um, we, you know, these truths of our faith that meant something to us in one way before, but we have to kind of go to a deeper level. We have to unpack it more thoroughly. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I kind of think about, um, you know, like uh, Thomas Aquinas, he, he talks about this, this idea of the analogy of being and where, um, you know, we uh, when it comes to spiritual matters, we can only talk analogously because our knowledge, our understanding of the world comes to our physical senses um, primarily, and we can't physically sense the spiritual dimension. And so we kind of have to use analogies to talk about these spiritual realities. And if, you've, if you're familiar with this phrase, analogies always limp, There's, they always fall short in some way. So in our language about the faith, there's always going to be some way where it falls short of the reality. And this is where I think it's beautiful to, um, 
you know, that's where, why we have to go through this reexamination of things. Um, I think of like C.S. Lewis when he talks about, he compares theology to a map. Um, and he says, the point of theology, the point of a map is not the map. You know, if you've got a map of an amusement park, which I can never read those things. I'm like, <laughs> but yeah. the, the point of the map is to help you get to the next roller coaster so you can enjoy the roller coaster. And the point of theology is to explore new places in God. It's not, it's not the point in itself. It's helping us to get closer to God. It's, uh, and to experience God in our own life. Yeah. I was, I was also thinking of Lewis, uh, when he talks mm -hmm. about when, when, I don't remember where he says this, but I should find, it. I think it's an essay, you know, when, when Christ really happens in our lives, it's like the shattering of all our, of our idolatries, mm -hmm. right? which you could say is a sort of a kind of deconstruction. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. and also, I mean, Pope Benedict's well back when he was just Joseph Ratzinger, um, in his, in his book, Introduction to Christianity, will say that the, the believer, this is a massive paraphrase, but the, the, the believer can't help but doubt, right? And the, yeah. the atheist can't mm -hmm. help but wonder about faith. And yeah. I think it takes a lot of, um, I appreciate the more charitable light that you're, <laughs> the, the, the not redu reductionistic light that you're framing deconstructionism under in that, <laughs> yeah, this kind of, these kind of answers don't, aren't aren't facing the the strength and the weight of reality and so they may be in this point in their spiritual journey of mm -hmm. like wait a minute if christ is real and they haven't they haven't fully abandoned him right then like where maybe they have the the incorrect or the wrong framework but they're sincerely yeah. really seeking the question of like yeah. how does christ respond to my need here and now to my ideas yeah. here and now and yeah. you know, that's that's something that every serious christian I think it has to go through. Um, you know, you can't have eighth grade confirmation yeah. <laughs> uh, level. I would just add to that. I, yeah. I do think that um, I do think that that has been a kind of weak point in the Catholic culture um, is yes. really relating our strength is doctrine. Our strength is metaphysics. It's it's the ontological. It's the the actually the nature of reality. Um, and, and Catholic theology is unparalleled when it comes to uh, the objective side of things. The subjective side where we say, how, does it, how do I relate to that personally? I think that's an, an area where we, we still have room to grow. It's not like you can't find it in the Catholic tradition. It's just that it's not as common. So um, in other words, like even just something as simple as, as um, navigating the inter interior life, navigating my internal world. You know, I was just listening to a podcast with um, Matt Frad and Dr. Bob Schutz. Beautiful conversation, but Dr. Bob Schutz is, is a counselor, a psychologist, um, and therapist who, um, you know, they were, he was talking about, you know, what do we do with the wounds that, are, that we carry in our hearts? And Matt Frad said, hey, are you, is, if, is the average, you know, are we going to be able to find this idea of wounds in um, in the church fathers, you know, in the church history? And and the reality is, no, like it's it's kind of there, but we have new language for it today um, that that we've benefited from psychology to 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 get into that like unpacking of the internal world, the unpacking of our our thought life, our heart, our hearts, and so. Um, yeah, that that relating it to me personally is is an area where. Um, I, I do think that some there's there's benefits um, that we can find from some uh, like non traditionally Catholic sources that and so the the question yeah, is right. okay if we how do we derive the benefits from those without it pushing us outside you know yeah. outside the lane pushing us into the gutter you yeah. know where are boundaries and our guardrails within that but 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 I mean I agree with you in terms of like Catholic when we're so good at doctrine, when we're so good at dogma, the culture that comes out of that uh, can almost be like the, the person who thinks that the map is for the sake of the map, right? Instead of yeah. the honor and the experience of God, yeah. um, which is not what the map itself says, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. but there you have it. Um, I mean, you know, I, 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 I am fascinated by um, Dostoevsky's critique of Western rationalism um when he said that beauty will save the world and, mm -hmm. and it was a critique on kind of like the kantian hyper rationalism of the west okay and yeah. is, is beauty and it's the sacraments 
another word for the, mm. the Eastern church is the mysteries that will save. Right? Yeah. Something weird. Yeah. Yes, our Western tradition is so good at the, the science, the logic, the math, yep. and the technology. Yep. But then we, we, that get, is, sets us up for a huge temptation to miss out on the whole personal relationship part, which is like the essential part. Yep. Um, all this stuff and systems is supposed to lead to. And, you know, I think you know that my own spiritual father, Father Giussani, who founded yeah. the movement of communal liberation. Mm -hmm. He saw that problem in Italy. I mean, in the 1950s, yeah. and he, you know, he was a brilliant theologian, set up to go teach seminary, was on his path to becoming bishop. I mean, he was mm. a huge, massive intellect, and he mm -hmm. actually wanted to just teach high school because he thought, wow, here are all these people that they know they can read, they can recite the catechism, right? They know all the stuff but they didn't have the the richness and the beauty and the experience of jesus the way that he had experienced it and he was he, you know it, he wanted to to transmit the experience that he had to them so um you know we, it's yeah. interesting to like look at history and see you know what are the struggles that we're facing with now and i i think that you kind of hit the nail on the head with um you know we can kind of miss the point of the richness of all this was i mean saint thomas aquinas what greater systematic thinker than him but in the end he was a mystic at the end yeah. of the day <laughs> so yeah. we need to follow his suit so should we get should we dive into this document together yeah, absolutely <laughs> yes um, um so um the the document kind of from after its introduction and talking about why it's here it it goes into these, it has these six sections that are kind of these six categories of um, areas that it wants to address in doctrine. Again, it's kind of laying out the parameters and not necessarily trying to solve every problem, but um, but I thought we could just kind of work through those and then also kind of say, well, how might this relate to us personally? So Great, that's perfect, um, that's great. That's the Christian method. How does it matter, yeah. <laughs> how does it matter to me? <laughs> Fantastic. This is my dream, Jim. This is like I, I'm a yeah. theology nerd that, you know, is le want, want, <laughs> Excellent. Ever, want Jesus. So, yeah. Excellent. So, the, the first section then is um, it is titled the, the Fullness and the Definitiveness of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, and, uh, oh, we kind of we kind of introduced, you know, uh, a little bit of the background of the document, but without really talking about what is it, uh, you know. So Dominus Jesus, of course, is the uh, in the in the tradition of uh, you know these um, church documents. It's the first two words of the document: Jesus, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, right? Dominus Jesus, um, and that's that's the focal point. It's on the 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 expanded title of it is on the unicity and salvific universality of Jesus Christ and the Church. It's just saying um how why why are jesus and the church so important <laughs> in very plain terms um uh and, more and so than, the more, more than just so important why jesus and the church is the is the way the way yes. is in the life for everyone yeah. yeah exactly and so this idea of universality and so the, the first one talks about revelation the, the first area it's going to talk about is um the universality or the definitiveness of the revelation of Jesus. Um, and so in a nutshell, it's really just emphasizing that our, our Christian, our Catholic belief says Jesus is the full, complete, and definitive revelation of God. And this is in contrast to, you know, theories which might propose that, that Jesus brought a, taught us a part of who God is, and that maybe we can look to the other religions of the world to flesh out the full picture. Um, and so um, the, the document is saying, you know, we can't just look at Jesus as just one among many religious leaders. And, and, we, and it's not that he just brought part of the revelation, part of the story. It is the full revelation of God uh, and of who he is. Um, and so if I think about like, what are, what are kind of some of the you know, interior questions that people might have that would kind of lead them down a road that might call this into question. And I, and I think um, I, I'll just kind of harken back to the example I gave, I gave earlier is that maybe as somebody is growing, uh, they kind of the stock answers that they're used to getting in, in the Catholic tradition and in, in our Catholic culture, 
maybe they just don't seem to really address the particular situation or crisis that somebody is facing. And they're saying, you know, um, I keep hearing the same answers over and over again. Mm -hmm. Maybe I've actually, and they're not really doing it for me. <laughs> So maybe, maybe I've exhausted everything that Christianity has to offer. Maybe, maybe this doesn't give me the complete picture. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, and so the, the response to that is to, uh, of this document is to say, um, and I'm going to quote here, in this definitive word of his revelation, God has made himself known in the fullest possible way. In other words, in Jesus, God has made himself known in the fullest possible way. There's, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing that could be said that hasn't been said through Jesus. Um, it also goes on to say, Jesus perfected revelation by fulfilling it through his whole work of making himself present and manifesting himself. So uh, real quick, I think one important point to, to draw out from this is that um, before we think of Jesus as a messenger, we need to think of him as the message. Yeah. It's not just that he taught or delivered the full, the full revelation of God. He is the full revelation of God. And that's a really important distinction to, to start off with. Yeah, that is what makes us different <laughs> Yeah, than all the other faith traditions out there. Like he is in his person the way yeah 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 and so he is he he's the full revelation and so um that's not the same thing as to say is is that our theology is the full revelation because our theology is our attempt to um unpack and to put into words and to and to put this into a terminology and a language that we can right. we can wrestle with because right the the revelation is 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 mystery right which is not um Mm -hmm. which is not obscurity so much as it is, uh, you know, it's not the lack of intelligibility as, as uh, Aquinas would say, it's the super abundance of intelligibility. It's just, there's so much to explore and so much to know that we just kind of, with our words, we kind of chip away at, at pieces of it. And we we're in this constant process of unfolding and unpacking it. Right. And we don't, you know, what's fascinating to me is that there's, you know, a development of doctrine that happened through the centuries. Of course, we have the benefit of mm -hmm. 2,000 years of that development of doctrine. The Holy Spirit leads wow. us into all truth and understanding, but he does in pieces. Mm -hmm. We're going to be dead before there's some sort of maybe some theological breakthrough maybe that would, be, would have been really cool for us to know while we were alive. But hey, we're in the kingdom of God and God willing. So, you know, who cares? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I remember when I was in graduate school, I was doing a lot of research on the sacrament of confirmation because I'm Eastern Catholic, you know, Western, you know, how we do it different and what does it all mean? I don't even understand what confirmation is. So I was, do I was doing all this research and I was really unsatisfied, Jim. I was like, this mm -hmm. is just not, yeah. I just, I'm not satisfied. Yeah. And I went to the professor who happened to be the diocesan liturgy guy. So there was nobody higher I could go to in the diocese than him. And I was like, Father, I am unsatisfied with the answers that theology is providing about this sacrament. And he, <laughs> he just calmly nods his head and goes, oh, yes, no, we do need more theological work on this yeah. sacrament. And I was like, well, that was honest and very <laughs> helpful because I just, you know, yeah this is just not enough for me yeah yeah and that's it's so beautiful to just get that perspective because it um the 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 danger is that when we run into the the shortcomings and the inadequacies of um of the theology that it might lead us to say well maybe jesus himself is insufficient right no no it's not that jesus it's like he is the full revelation we need to go deeper into him to continue to develop our understanding and hone our understanding. So yep. it's, it's to always bring it back to that question of, um, you know, our words might be insufficient, but he is not insufficient. He is not lacking. There's nothing lacking. And there's, there's, um, he's brought us everything that we need for, to have the full revelation of God. Amen. Yes. So that's on the topic of revelation. And so, um, the next section, uh, focuses more on the area of salvation. Um, and it, it's talk, it says the title of this section is the incarnate logos and the Holy Spirit in the work of salvation. Um, 
And the, the, the foundation here, the doctrine is that um, Jesus of Nazareth is the unique incarnation of the Logos and the center of all salvation history. Um, and, uh, and so um, here it's, well, it's actually, um, I'm going to back up and say we're, we're, we're tying this especially to the historical Jesus. Um, and it, it's saying that there have been theories proposed that maybe, um, maybe Jesus is one incarnation of the divine logos that are one manifestation of it but the logos is still kind of supersedes jesus somehow um and and he's active in all these different ways and in in other religions um and so in a sense the first one the error was to reduce jesus to his human limitations how one person couldn't possibly have told us everything there is to know about god um, this one is that the error is to kind of um, abstract the divinity of Jesus from his humanity and say, well, you know, we don't want to just limit ourselves to the human Jesus. We, it's really the, the, the divine logos that operates on this higher plane that, that is the real essential key. Right. Um, in a lot of ways, this um, uh, it reminds me of some of what like Irenaeus was dealing with, with, um, you know, the, the early um gnostic heresies which were um really just kind of saying well there's some kind of like secret knowledge that that is beyond is that's you know not really in the scriptures it kind of like it it like rides above it somehow you know and and that's the true knowledge and this is the other one that the scriptures are just kind of like for people who can't really ascend to this level um right and so that the um you know, it's sort of like, all right, well, why might somebody kind of, uh, okay, so just to back up, so the, the, the doctrine is we can't separate the two, that, that Jesus, the, the Logos was fully incarnate in the, the person of Jesus of Nazareth, um, and again, back to that full revelation, so it's, we can't separate that. Yeah, which is, again, these are, these are not new problems in the church, mm-hmm. Taking on like new, yeah. new forms, but they're not they're not new they're not new problems. Um, yeah. Well, there's also but maybe a- maybe the circumstances of our world present the problem in a new way, and so I think one yeah. of those ways that it presents itself is um, just the the level of connectedness that we have in our world today. I think I think in in times past, um, uh, you know, it could be easy for me to just make certain assumptions about other religions and, and that they're like, how like awful they are, but maybe, you know, now we're in this connected world, we're interacting with coworkers and we, in, we interact with people who are of these different religions. We're like, wow, there's some really beautiful stuff in there. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I can't just kind of like, you know, brush that aside or not acknowledge the beauty of it. Or maybe there's even ways that I've benefited from my interactions with these other religions. Again, maybe there's way, ways that they have articulated certain dem- aspects of the human experience that, that I haven't encountered in, in um, my own you know, history of being Catholic. And so um, you know, I, I think there could be kind of this desire to affirm other religions in a way that, that um, diminishes the role, the unique role of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, that was, yeah. again, um, Ratzinger, when he became Pope Benedict, he wrote this series of books, Jesus of Nazareth. It's, it's this yeah, tight connecting divinity yeah. with the historical reality of this man who walked the earth. Yes. And I, I think what you're saying in, in terms of like taking seriously, and, and, the, and church documents will say this, that there's rays of truth in perhaps these other faith exactly. religions that come from this source, by the yeah. way. Um, that we can affirm and we can have dialogue about that mm-hmm. without falling into. And that I, I love that the document talks about this, this kind of relativistic attitude uh, toward mm-hmm. faith or religious indifferentism, another yeah. the phrase the document uses. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like you said, we can, we can uphold and acknowledge the beauty in, in these other religions. And, but then there's always whatever is like, uh, whatever is, you know, of truth and of substance there it always points back to jesus so um uh here's what here's what dominus jesus says about this um Which you know are you on now? oh i didn't grab my paragraphs oh, unfortunately worry, i have sec i'm in sections uh i should have known better 
No, it's um, not right. But it says, in the process of discovering and appreciating the manifold gifts and especially the spiritual treasures that God has bestowed on every people, that's every, all cultures, we cannot separate those gifts from Jesus Christ, who is at the center of God's plan for salvation. And so all of this serves as a preparation for the gospel yeah. and can only be understood in reference to Christ. Um, it finds its ultimate meaning only in Christ, who is, who is by the way, who's not only the, the full revelation of God, he's the full revelation of man, mm. right? He is the second Adam. We, we don't, uh, we can't fully comprehend comprehend who humanity is what humanity is and who the human person is apart from christ he is the full as the second adam he is the the full and complete picture of humanity yeah john paul ii his first encyclical it's called redemptor hominis really addresses that very very well and and that was a you know problem i think also in the early church it wasn't that was jesus god it seemed to be clear that he was but is he mm -hmm. is he fully human so I'm glad that you pointed out because then we know ourselves in getting to know and encountering him. Yeah. Beautiful. Exactly. Awesome. So let's, let's go, let's go ahead and keep plowing through this because yeah. it's, there's so much here. I love it. There is. Uh, yeah. Short the, document. The third, <laughs> yeah. The third section, and there's a lot of overlap between these, but they all have their own kind of unique flavor. And this one is on the unicity and universality of the salvific mystery of Jesus Christ. And this is really emphasizing Jesus as the unique and uh, source of salvation. So in other words, we can't, um, any theories, um, we can't propose theories which would say that God saves some people through Jesus, but he has established additional paths or other ways to salvation um, for other people, for other people groups, let's say. Um, right. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and read this section. It's a little long, but it's it's uh, weighty. Um, it says not infrequently it is proposed that theology should avoid the use of terms like unicity, universality, and absoluteness, which give the impression of excessive emphasis on the significance and value of the salvific event of Jesus Christ in relation to other religions. In reality, and so in other words, so he's saying um, some people get uncomfortable with us saying. It's the only path. It's that Jesus is the only way to salvation, that it's the one true faith, you know, things like that. It makes some people squeamish. But the document goes on to say, in reality, such language is simply being faithful to revelation. From the beginning, the community of believers has recognized in Jesus a salvific value that such that he alone, as son of God made man, crucified and risen, by the mission received from the Father and in the power of the Holy Spirit, bestows revelation divine life and divine life to all humanity and to every person. So um, it's consistent with our history just to say, and uh, just, um, and the revelation of Jesus, again, he is the one unique path to salvation. Right. I, um, I remember encountering this problem as a, as a young adult, maybe younger than a young adult, mm -hmm. um, with this kind of like religious relativism that this document is confronting. And, and, that was one of the pieces that actually for a time led me away from the Catholic church. I thought, well, if you guys don't actually even believe this, wow, yeah, that's was pretty demanding. And the Catholic church is very demanding. So yeah. you guys don't believe this. And there are other ways out there. I'm just, I don't know if I can like stay into this, you know, and I, mm -hmm. and I went on a Protestant trek for a while because yeah. the Protestants that I had met were like, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Yeah. Yeah, they carry that banner very, very well. Like, they do. Yeah, they yeah. do. And, 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 you know, and I had, you know, I intellectually converted back to the Catholic faith, but I really was looking for people who believe this, you know? Um, <laughs> I, thought, yeah. I mean, if this is just like a cafeteria, if I'm just like picking and choosing here, I mean, I could go for something a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is yep. pretty hard. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think, um, I think that a lot of people can probably resonate with the the discomfort of you know like ah like do I really want to like come down that on that bring bring that hard line down you know and I think part of it is just because the reality of today is that like dialogue feels more and more impossible right it just seems like right. everybody is kind of their own like in their own world 
um, you know, spitting out their own opinions and not really interested in listening. And, and the, the idea of, oh my gosh, like, do I really want to just do it almost like, do I want to be another one of those? <laughs> you know, do I want to be like, no, it's my way. Like I have the, the answers or whatever, you know, and it's yeah. just, there's a discomfort that's, that's understandable, or even maybe just the seeming impossibility of the task of ever convincing anybody of anything. Like, gosh, right. aren't we all just trying to do our best and let's, let's live and let live. But, um, but it, again, it comes back to this reality of, um, you know, Peter or J Jesus's question to Peter, who do you say that I am? Like, yeah. and, and if, you know, uh, I heard it said this one, by one, uh, one um, pastor, uh, again, a, uh, you know, Protestant uh, evangelical pastor, but um, he said, if, if Jesus is not, if there are other ways that people could be saved, apart from Jesus, then it was unbelievably cruel for God the Father to make Jesus die, wow. to allow him to go through yeah. the pain and suffering of the cross the the torment the the you know the torture of the cross for our salvation if that wasn't the only way if he could make other ways man what kind of father would would do that yeah. to his son if there could have been another way yeah. um that's and so very interesting perspective yeah, yeah and that's i why well, I, I never even thought about that i found myself because i i do agree with you it's harder and harder to dialogue i think yeah for various reasons but my close friends when I was younger than a young adult were actually not even Christians, but we all believed in our faith traditions, right? Mm -hmm. My closest friends were, you know, middle school, um, a Muslim girl and a Hindu girl. Yeah. And then there was me, <laughs> but we all believed that what we believed was the truth. Yeah. So we bonded over that. And we're like, why don't other people believe wow. in their own faith traditions? You That's know? interesting. And when you when you really believe what you believe, you want other people to to agree with you. And that doesn't mean that you don't love them, but you you yeah. you know, it's, it's in fact the opposite, right? Uh we all wanted to convince yeah. each other and we enjoyed that kind of dialogue. It was true, true, true dialogue, but what we couldn't stand, and what I think I think especially young people cannot stand is when people aren't really convicted about what they believe. Because if it mm -hmm. if it doesn't matter, then why should I why should I care? Why should I even yeah. care? So yeah. anyway. Yeah, and and kind of related to that, um, this is a theme throughout the document, but it really just kind of comes to the fore here is is this really highlights this urgency for evangelization for inviting people into that into the relationship with jesus into the church because gosh there's there's no other way now now to be clear um part of um part of the reason that that some of the alternative theologies or you know uh, theories you might say has been proposed is because of um in vatican II, it did acknowledge that that salvation is possible for those who are not in the in the visible external church who are not at, you know in the church um but it does does affirm that it is somehow anybody who is saved is saved through jesus whether they are visibly in the church or not and so right. um that's that's again one of those guardrails we have to say well is salvation possible for people who have never known jesus and never had the opportunity to to have faith in him yes it's possible it's still through Jesus. We don't know how that works exactly. We just know that that's the only way. And I, I like how this document, I mean, that the Catholic church is the one true church and that all other, you know, our, our Protestant brothers and sisters and, and the Orthodox, the apostolic, that, the, that those churches have, we have true communion with them through baptism, mm -hmm. right? And that they subsist under the one visible yeah. church, right? They would probably not like that, but that's what we believe. Yeah. Um, that if, if, we, if we are saved, like you said, we're saved through Jesus and his church. And I love that this document says it's up to theologians to kind of work on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good luck. <Yep. laughs> but we can live in that tension. We can, we can have our strong faith and firmly profess this. While at the same time, you know, yeah. and I love, again, the wording of this document, in ways known only unto God. Mm -hmm. well, that if people are saved outside of her visible boundaries that you know that's that's like, like you said it's, it's kind of god's problem and we just continue with our own urgent mission to evangelize because that's the mission that jesus gave and we just yeah. we don't have anxiety about it we just trust in god's mercy and love and just keep keep with that urgency 
keep mm-hmm. and you know, keep at it and just know if they're saved, they're saved through Jesus and that's it. I yeah. don't to stress out. Just keep yeah. going. Just keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? So Yeah. And so much this is kind of worth mentioning. So much of this document, like I think the most quoted the other document of uh, that is most quoted in this is John Paul II's Redemptoris Missio, um, the mission of the Redeemer. Yeah. Um, and so you, this is kind of ta- almost taking um, JP2's, that document, and sort of applying it to specific situations in a lot of ways. So um, if somebody wanted to go deeper on this, that would be kind of the next, the next step to take because uh, it's so rich. Um, there's so much in there. And, and, if, and we've, we've got to get that down like i mean it, if you can't if you don't have that piece down nothing else falls into place nothing else makes sense um that that jesus is the universal savior of of mankind and of all creation like um yes and so while we while we say on the one hand um yes god's tremendous mercy and providence uh makes makes it possible for people who are outside of the church, outside, you know, non-Christians, for instance, to um, to be saved. We 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 have to say they're in a very disadvantaged place. Like it's it's not, um, you know, it's not like oh well, either way, you get you you know everybody gets their their shot or whatever. It's like no, it's sort of like the best analogy I could come up with would be to say. Um, imagine you give somebody a bow and arrow, you put a blindfold on them, spin them in a circle and tell them to shoot. Uh, you say, oh, is there a chance they'll hit the target? Yeah, there's a chance, but oh my gosh, that's, that's, you're not setting them up for success. And so, um, we, we can't under, we can't, um, under, um, emphasize, um, or another way to say it, we, we, yeah, we can't. Uh, it would be erroneous to underemphasize the importance of of actually getting people the message of Jesus to people and giving them the opportunity to actually um, give their lives to them him personally. Yeah. yeah. And explicitly. There is no time for anything other than zeal. Missionaries. Yeah. Zeal. <laughs> yeah. And if I mean, Father Giustani would say this a lot. Those who have encountered Jesus have the missionary zeal because when you mm-hmm. have encountered him you really want to share him with everyone yeah. else it's just too good to keep to yourself and that's true on natural goods you know if i see a beautiful sunset or listen yeah. to music i'm already thinking about the 10 people i got a text message because they got to hear this amazing song how much more true is yeah. that for for jesus christ you know so uh love love yeah. <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta love like i love what you said jim you're like we gotta figure this out <laughs> <laughs> we've got to figure this out um any other anything else we should just again we're just briefly going through this document it's not long totally worth the read yeah you know i i think we've uh we've hit on the major points you actually kind of anticipated the next section which is um you know, tying in not only like Jesus as the savior, but also tying in that, that the universality of the church, um, at, because the church is the body of Christ and, and there, um, and that we can't, um, we can't separate that and, and kind of abstract that from, from the church on earth. Now there, there are, um, so many levels of nuance in this, um, yes. you know, especially as it relates to, you mentioned, uh, other, other Christians, they are separated brethren, and I think the important thing to, to em- emphasize there is brethren, like yeah, yeah. actual brothers. You know, we yeah. we actually say that um, we acknowledge in in most cases, most Christian denominations, we acknowledge their baptism. They they have the sacrament of baptism, not even just not yeah. even just as an imitation of or like a poor, you know, second. You know, we don't rebaptize, you know, Christians who become Catholic because we acknowledge that. And what does that mean? We're grafted into the same body. So, um, sorry, that's where I, that's, that's an area where I get really pumped up to, you know, like ecumenism is a really high value to me of, of acknowledging the value of, of other Christian religions. But at the same time, as highly as I value other Christian denominations and, and just, um, and I've gained so much from them, um, I still have to come back to this reality of, 
God's full plan is unity in the Catholic Church. And that's a, that's a non-negotiable in our faith because it's, again, kind of like you can't abstract the logos from the, pers- yeah. the, the, the historical person of Jesus. We can't simply make the church an abstract reality without tying it to the actual structures that, that Jesus established in the church through um, through the, you know, apostolic succession of, you know, the, the Pope in communion or the bishops in communion with the Pope. So. Amen. That's a great note to end on. And, um, I so grateful for this conversation, Jim, love your passion, love your zeal and your just brilliance and clarity of thought in unpacking this document with us. So thank you so much. And maybe we'll talk again soon. That sounds great. Thanks so much for having me.